Hi, I'm Maureen Metcalf, host of Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I'm also a fellow with the International Leadership Association, which has partnered with us again this year to bring you guests with exceptional leadership insights, this time from ILA's 2022 annual conference in Washington, D.C. While our guests were exceptional, our recording room was not. So please excuse the sporadic background noise. It's more than worth your indulgence, as you're about to hear. Welcome to Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute. I am delighted to have with us today, Diane Rosenfeld. She's a lecturer on law and the founding director of the Gender Violence Program at Harvard Law School, where she taught since 2004. So Diane, why don't you jump in? And what I really want to hear about is your book, The Bonobo Sisterhood, Revolution Through Female Alliance. It is such an important topic for us to be discussing today. As you said, I teach at Harvard Law School and I've been teaching there since 2004. My background is as a lawyer specializing in legal policy on violence against women, including working here in DC at the Justice Department in the Violence Against Women office. In 2004, I learned about bonobos, and they blew my mind as a model of human behavior. So I'll talk to you about bonobos, and I started working on how to integrate a bonobo model into human society in a way, and the product of all that work is this book. Since this is a leadership podcast, let's talk about for leaders listening either emerging leaders or senior leaders, how does this tie to leadership? It ties exactly to leadership. So if you will, let me explain how bonobos work and what is so fascinating about them. Bonobos, for those of you who don't know, are our evolutionary cousins. They look like chimpanzees, but they're actually a separate species from chimpanzees, but only recently identified as that in 1929. They're about four feet tall. They look very much like chimpanzees, except their muzzles are a little bit darker. They're a totally different primate, and they developed on the opposite side of the Congo. So if a female bonobo was attacked by a male, she would let out a special cry. <coughs> and the other females within earshot, whether they know her, like her, or are related to her, come immediately to her aid, and they form an instant coalition. They fend off the male and send him into isolation. Permanent isolation? No, temporary isolation. Okay. He comes back, they all make up, and they live happily ever after. They are a peaceful primate. There's no lethal aggression like there is in chimpanzees. They are 98.7% related to humans in their DNA. And I think they present this just fascinating model for humans. So I asked, what if women came to one another's aid, whether we like each other, know each other, or are related to each other? And what would happen? And what would happen is that we will stop male sexual coercion. This will require leadership. It will require the people who pick up this book and read it and think about it and are challenged and inspired by it to say, hey, I'm a bonobo and I'm just going to lead. I'm not going to ask for permission or direction or anything like that. I'm just going to lead. And when I hear that one of my sisters is in trouble, when I hear a bonobo call, I'm going to answer it. And I'm not the only one who's going to answer it. I'm going to lead in getting my other sisters to come with me to answer it. As of this recording, we're seeing significant unrest in Iran yeah. based on the moral police. Can you talk a little bit about how this plays in that specific situation? Yes. I think that we should take a step back in analyzing the whole question of morality mm -hmm. and the morality police and the idea of women covering themselves up based on the idea that men cannot control their sex drives so that if a woman is uncovered, then she will provoke a male attack. And uncovered, you mean they show their hair, not their... Yeah, I mean their hair and their face if they don't have a veil on. That assumption that underlies so much of our patriarchal religion is problematic in many ways. And what is going on in Iran seems to me a very bonobo-like response because the women are standing up for one another, women of all ages, and saying, you could not do that to her. She was my sister. The bonobo principle, as I call it, is the idea of two principles. The first is that no one has the right 
to exploit, abuse, threaten, pimp, et cetera, et cetera, my sister. And if you believe that, you're halfway to being part of the bonobo sisterhood. The second part is that everybody is my sister. So I'm required to take action when I see any kind of inappropriate behavior, whether it's assault or in a workplace, just disrespect. Right, right. And in a workplace, it's so significant when women stand up for one another. And it's not something that we're often trained to do. I think that oftentimes girls in American culture are brought up to please men. And if we're in a situation where we're in a board meeting and a woman says something, but there are only two women on the board, we might not support her because we're afraid of losing our association with the male power that's in the room. And the lesson that bonobos teach us is that we have power when we form alliances with each other. And it's a power that I don't think has been explored anywhere close to its full potential yet. And I'm hoping that this book really pushes this idea forward that females through strong female-female alliances really can change the whole structure of a patriarchal society. Say more about women and power, especially as we think about in the boardroom setting and in executive halls for mid-level women and for junior women coming up. I was often the only woman in a room. I assume you were the same. So we built relationships with our male colleagues because that was the only choice. Not that we wouldn't have anyway, but I didn't necessarily always have women who would advocate. So power didn't come from strong female alliance. And I'm curious how that's evolving. Right. I think that's a great question. And taking it a step further is how do we make power come from female alliance? And we just have to be like bonobos. So I gave a talk at the Harvard bookstore last week, and a young woman asked a question along these lines and said, my experience at the consulting firm that she worked at was that the senior women didn't take care of the younger women at all. In bonobos, the older females always come to the aid of the younger females because the older ones can win fights on their own, but the bonobo juveniles are more vulnerable, so the older ones always come to their aid. Younger ones can ask older ones to come to their aid. Now that there's this book and this body of research and thinking and questions and models and calls to action, actually a young woman in a workplace could present this book to an older woman in the workplace and say, let's form an alliance. We will be stronger together. In a patriarchy, which we are in, the whole world is a patriarchy, everything that's formed has been formed through male-male alliance. And that's really significant. And that's one of the very important lessons that I learned from studying primatology with my colleague, Richard Rangham, because in law, at the law school, in culture, we don't talk about patriarchy as a social order. We just take it for granted because that's what it is and that's what it always has been. And that's how power is distributed in our society. So law is the product of patriarchy. It's very obvious in many cases, many cases I talk about in the first part of the book. It reflects agreements between men over their rights, their property, and their control of women. For women to try to come in and shoehorn the law into a form that protects them isn't going to work, it turns out. We need like a whole new way of thinking about it and leadership and collaboration across all lines for females is what has to take place. This is the backdrop. How is the book structured? Good question. The book is structured in three parts. The first part is the problem. The second part is the pivot. And the third part is the promise. So the problem is male sexual violence is rampant in our society. Three to four women a day still are killed by their intimate partners in the United States. 40,000 women on average call for help every day. There are women and children who are seeking refuge from domestic violence. That makes them refugees, and that makes it necessary for us to recognize this as a crisis. This is a refugee crisis. 7,000 plus are turned away. They don't have enough shelters. So I deal with those kinds of problems in the first part of the book. And I would love to say to our listeners that If the problems in the first five chapters seem too heavy, skip right ahead to the pivot because the pivot is this. You have a self-worth defending. 
And to enact this in the world, I want everyone to take a self-defense course along with reading the book. That a bonobo-inspired self-defense course means I can defend myself. But once you take a self-defense course, you really learn in your body somatically that you have the power to defend your sisters. And women are often better at defending others than they are themselves. If you think about women giving advice to other women and saying, oh my God, you've got to get out of that relationship. He's just not good enough for you or he's not treating you right, but are unable to do that in their own relationships because society places such high value on our relationships with males. In a business setting. Yeah. What's the equivalent to a self-defense course? Not to minimize now, I need to go add that to my to-do list. But how do I defend in a work context, my sisters, my colleagues? Is there an equivalent to a self-defense course that helps me somatically say, my friend Diane, when we go downstairs, someone says something that's inappropriate. How do I get comfortable? Because I can't go kick them, or I probably shouldn't. But I could go up and say do you know who you're talking to? Mm -hmm. This is the amazing Diane and whatever the version is of go on your way. Exactly. When you take self-defense, you actually learn a lot of verbal skills first because most aggression can be diffused by a strong verbal signal that you're just not going to take it. Like you can't do this to me and you can't do this to my sister, the bonobo principle in action. In a business setting, what's really important is Something that Valerie Jarrett used to do when she was in the White House with President Obama is that if a woman said something at a meeting, she would amplify and she would teach other women to do the same thing. And I do this with my students and my students in classrooms. If somebody says something, I encourage them to then amplify what they said in the classroom. And it can take place anywhere, but we have to amplify each other and stand with each other. So what does Amplify look like? So do this with me now. Amplify looks like, that was a really great point, and, or if I observe that you're getting pushback on something, I can help diffuse that too. Let me help jump in and further expound on what Diane just said. Right. Or something that says, I am in support of, and the idea may not be fully built out, which in many cases, not with you, of course, but with a lot of us, what comes out of our mouth doesn't exactly equal what's in our head. Right. That's another interesting point because so much of this happens within our head. (laughs) And our self-judgment, like where we learn that we're not worthy, that we don't have a self-worth defending is by being a girl in a patriarchy where we're not treated from the get-go as equal with the same entitlements that males will have. And it's not expected that we're going to be strong in the same ways. So there's an example in the book of a friend who has two kids and a boy and a girl And the girl had a t-shirt that said strong and fierce. And the boy would never have a t-shirt that said strong and fierce. He wouldn't need it. He wouldn't need it because we assume we give that kind of social currency to boys. And there are just infinite ways of supporting other women and girls that will come up in your everyday life. If you're just open to it, you start with your head and you stop judging. If women can consciously learn to stop judging themselves first and other women second and just say, you know, she can wear whatever she wants. That's her fashion choice. Might not be my fashion choice, but she has the right to wear whatever she wants. And I'm going to stand up for her right to do that. And you can't call her that. And just start training ourselves to stop judging, which is so much work because we're absolutely socialized to divide against one another. And compete. And compete. And compete for what? Well, as we think back physiologically, men compete for partners, women compete for partners. And we are wired then to physiologically, not even social structure, wired to compete for the strongest men, most productive men, all those things. And I think we just unconsciously often take some of that really primitive wiring into our behavior, even though we are allegedly a highly conscious species. Right, right. That's a super interesting angle And especially for this book, because we've assumed through the years that our wiring would be based on chimpanzees and gorillas and other primate cousins of ours, and we haven't focused on bonobos. So we could equally say that we are wired for the females to protect one another. And that's one of the really original thesis points of the book, is that what if our wiring is actually completely different? And I think that 
I'm not answering or seeking to answer the question of is world nature or nurture. It's absolutely a combination of both. And I think that let's start on the nurture side and then look to bonobos for the nature side and see what comes up. So what I think you're also saying, at least what I, I'm hearing is whether it's nature or nurture. I'm here at whatever age I am. And there's been a lot of nature and a lot of nurture to get me here. Mm -hmm. I can still refine and be more conscious of my choices and retrain, untrain, retrain, unlearn, relearn how I respond to other women, other girls, and men. Right. Because my relationship to men will also change as my relationship to women changes. Right. Another really important point is how we invite men in as allies in this movement. This is not just a movement for women. But what happens when women band together is that I think and hope that men will raise their standard of behavior, especially in social and sexual situations, so that the rising tide really lifts all boats. And there are male allies without whom I would not be where I am today. Absolutely. The points that I make in the book are bigger, that we compete for male attention. Most essentially, though, we compete for male protection, and we're raised on the idea that males will protect us. Protect us from what? Other males. So I was on a plane a few years ago and reading Sky Mall magazine because I had exhausted all of my reading supplies, believe it or not. And there was an ad for Safety Man. And Safety Man was a blow-up doll who was white and had salt and pepper hair and appeared to be a six-foot-tall man who would offer you protection, who would keep vigil over your well-being while you were at home or in the car. I mean, it's hilarious. So I would have a blow-up man that I walked around my house with? You, no, you just sit him down in your house, and then other men, the idea goes, will not break into your house because they will see the presence of a man who's keeping vigil over your well-being, and they will not break in. Unless they're noticing that that man hasn't moved for years. Right, <laughs> right, right. Um, and at first I thought, oh, my God, this is hilarious. And then I thought, like, essentially – this is what men are, essentially, just protection. And women dolls, right, are for mm -hmm. sex. So so women are for sex and men are for protection. And then I thought, but it's protection from other men. And while this is a funny idea, it's an entryway into a much more profound truth that we look to men and we're trained to look for men for protection from other men. And women lose. The minute that we delegate our protection to someone else, we lose because then men get to decide who among us, in their opinion, is worthy of protection. And the obvious then extension of that is who's not worthy of protection. And who's not worthy of protection. Exactly. So then let's bring it back to leadership. I come into my office. I have a male boss. And I do want to say I've been really fortunate to have brilliant male advocates and allies too. And I don't hear anything in this that says we're bashing men. But inviting in allyship, I think, is crucial for those who are already predisposed to being supportive. Right. It gives men a new opportunity to support women and not be afraid of them. And here's a fun fact about bonobos. They're highly sexual, which is what most people know about them. They have lots of sexual encounters to diffuse tension right before they eat and all kinds of sexual encounters. So there's a lot of female-female, female-male, and male-male. And they're very happy and mutual about it. So if a male solicits a female and she doesn't show the same interest, he leaves her alone. Here's the point for men, the happy point for men. Males are successful in 70% of their initiations, which is probably, I'm guessing, higher than male humans. So bonobos just have a lot of sexual encounters. So it's not like this is going to be the end of sex if we eliminate male sexual coercion. It's not at all going to be that way. It's going to open the door for like a whole new world of mutual Almost an abundance mentality yes. around sex. Yes. There's always enough. Right. And it's an abundance mentality about everything. And everything that I learn about bonobos gives me hope. They share food. We have enough food in the United States to feed everybody twice over. There's no reason that a child should go hungry. The last part of the book is called The Promise. 
And it's all about how bonobos can inspire and model leadership behavior for everyone else. Everything about the bonobos gives me hope. Everything they do gives me hope. They share their food. They protect each other. They watch over each other's children. They're just fantastic. As I said, there's no lethal violence among bonobos, which separates them sharply from chimpanzees. And one of the things that it inspired me to think about is a different lens of equality. And what if instead of thinking about equality in terms of women and men, we start thinking about equality among and between women? So what does that look like? That looks like all women thinking about and identifying our resources and how we can share our resources and thinking about our privilege or our lack of privilege and really forming alliances to equalize the huge disparities among women. And to do this, we just need to think differently about the fact that we separate against each other to gain power in a patriarchy but really the trick of the bonobos is to realize that it's through our our strong alliances that we all do better. So this sounds like a significant mindset shift. So if I'm a person of privilege, and you and I both are by the fact that we're sitting here, does that mean I lose some of my privilege to help others? That's a great question. I would say absolutely not. That you, when you share your privilege, you gain the privilege of knowing that you shared, that you helped, that it's going to come back to you in a karmic way, and that all women will do better when we realize the bonobo principle. You talked earlier a little bit about abundance, and it makes me think about when I got my divorce, I wondered about how humans are wired. Are we meant to be monogamous? And all kinds of questions that aren't the topic here. But what that sparked me to do was start reading about early civilizations. And what do the Maasai do? What do Aborigines do? People that are closer to early human behavior. And there was a lot more in those eras of women coming together. Men went off and hunted women together in a camp or in a tribe, or I don't know the terminology, would work together to support all of the children, to cook collectively. They nursed each other's babies. I can't imagine any woman right now that I know who who would say there's a allowed child, let me go nurse somebody else's kid in the grocery store. So we've moved away from those mores. Right. But there is history among humans even where we behaved very differently toward each other. Right. And we could again... So my colleague, Richard Rangham, from whom I learned about bonobos originally, wrote a very fascinating book called Catching Fire. And it's about how the invention and discovery of fire really changed that and changed the time that it takes to cook food and family relationships and cultural relationships around that. But marriage has always been a patriarchal institution. And that's really an interesting thing to think about that, you know, we raise girls to like dream about their wedding day and the dress and where it's going to be, but never about like the person that they're going to marry. And it could be useful to focus a lot more on that than around marriage because marriage can be a wonderful institution. I am extremely fortunate and grateful to be married to my life partner. And that's wonderful when that works out. And it's important to think about that marriage was like a trade situation, that it was an agreement between a father and a husband over possession of a female. Who had certain economic value to the the new husband. Who had certain economic value. And, And there are many cultural practices around the globe that still recognize that and operate on that principle. It's very troubling. And and also, you know, we're humans and we can rethink things and we can change society and we can change laws. Bonobos did all of this without any law or constitution. And I think that that's really interesting too. I think that we could have a bonobo sisterhood constitution that's in the last part of the book. I imagine what it would contain and how we would really think about and concretize the idea of equality among women. And I think that when we change that lens, amazing things will happen. So your lens is 
law, Harvard law professor. My background is business. What is that constitution for a company? Changing the U.S. Constitution is too big for me to think about. Hmm. But I do work with clients who could implement something like this as part of their organizational structure, all the way down to the corporate bylaws, but certainly the agreements we have in our vision, in our ESG policies. This is absolutely doable in a corporation. And then as I think about what it does to attract and retain talent and employee engagement that's going to drive profitability, all of this has a a business ROI in a corporate setting that moves the needle, I think, in a way that we may not have considered before. I think that's brilliantly put and absolutely correct. I am also quite fortunate to have a mentor, Jane Dorenzo Piggott, who works in the area of diversity boards, retention, all of Mm -hmm. what you just mentioned. And it's related to the book in that patriarchy is based on, as I said, agreements between men over women. And we have to change the whole structure, the whole institution to think about when you equally value humans as humans for their talent, you are going to have a better product. You're not going to have as good of a product if you're spending unnecessary time on like domination and exclusion. And when you include other voices, you're going to get a whole different, much enriched picture of whatever corporate goal you have. So if we think back to my early Aborigines and Maasai, there were cultures that were female dominated or more equal. Then we went to patriarchy. And what we're talking about feels like another step in that crucial journey of how humans can live and behave and must do if we're going to create a better future than what we have. Some of our current systems have gotten us here and they have lived out their most productive phase and it's time to enter a different way of seeing the world. And this offers a brilliant model for us to consider what does next look like? We all talk about there needs to be something new, but what is it? And this seems like a door open to say, here's a model for what it can be, and here are some tools to get there. Right. So that's all in the last part of the book. And I'm really eager to enter the leadership space and really think with other corporate leaders about how to implement the messages in this book. And this book is not a Bible of what we should do. It's not entirely an action plan. It's a suggestion, and it's an invitation to the reader to come and rethink things that we've taken for granted for so long. And it's not just legal, absolutely. It's really about life and improving the standard of living for everyone. There's so much potential that corporations have, even more than government in a way, because they can just make new rules without having to pass them. And inclusion always makes the corporate bottom line better. Yeah, I'm thinking of one of my clients who's just started a women's resource center. It's a hotel company. Their goal is to have 40% of their franchise owners be women. How do you get there? And they're doing lots of great stuff, like making sure that they have lenders who have favorable terms for women. So all of the practical things one does to make this possible. And this gets to more of the mindset. I'm just imagining almost a study group or something. How do we, as part of our corporate culture, look at the agreements and the unconscious behaviors that we just don't intentionally disenfranchise, but we do disenfranchise? And so how do we think about our language, our legal agreements, our behavioral agreements, our code of conduct, our guiding principles, our vision for the company. All of that seems like from a board level down, there's an opportunity to shift and a lot of different avenues, certainly starting with your book and starting with these ideas and just thinking about how would one, how would I offer this to that organization as a start? I think that's a great question. The answer is to go back to this idea of equality among women and privilege And one of the things that we can do when we're identifying our own privilege is just get out of the mindset of what we currently value in a corporation anyway, and to really judge differently other people and invite unexpected voices into the room. 
So that might mean not only looking at grade point averages when you're looking at new hires, that you look at other things and you account for disadvantage and privilege withholding, if you will. And also racism. Racism is a huge factor that has to be dealt with. And I think that white women have a special role in identifying our privilege racially and disclaiming it because it's not legitimate. And to talk to black and brown women about what they go through on a daily basis that I as a white person don't is phenomenally chilling and so compelling. Like we have to do something about it. We have to stand with our sisters and say, nobody has the right to abuse my sister. Everybody's my sister. We can do that. We can adopt that kind of thinking in a corporate setting, of course. It means like letting go of a lot of things that we take for granted as knowledge or as standard qualifications and getting back to a corporate principle and saying, well, what really is our corporation going to do? What are we hoping to accomplish? Where is our ESG? How can we do better? And one of the things that I learned from Jane about finding good board members and where an all white male board will say, well, we just can't find anyone. And it's like, what if there were a $20,000 prize for finding someone? Would you find someone then? Oh, yeah. Or it just open the lens. Like the lens is created under a patriarchy. What we value in society has all been created and stated under a patriarchy. And we can just redefine that. And I know brilliant, well-qualified women that are not as leveraged in board roles as they could be. Right, right. And we need to support them. So we can have a Bonobo Sisterhood Alliance for corporations. We're going to start it here now. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to just open the pool and let everybody jump in and support them. I'm just imagining all of the permutations, some of them really positive and some less comfortable. I'm not saying it's going to be comfortable. It's never comfortable to identify your own privilege and how you might be enjoying something in a zero-sum kind of society. It might mean that somebody else is not enjoying something. It brings to mind sexual harassment in a workplace. And the claim is you can't treat me like that. I'm not a whore. You know what I mean? Like you can't treat me as if I'm always open to your sexual aggression or invitation because I'm not prostituted. But what does that mean for our prostituted sisters? Mm, Okay. Now I see where you're going. Yeah. And that's part of the bonobo principle. Like you can't do that to me, but you also can't do that to her. I don't ever want to claim privilege on the backs of my less fortunate sisters who don't have the privilege to say, you can't treat me like that. You can't treat any of us like that. And I talk in the book about a really compelling case of a young African-American woman in Milwaukee who is awaiting trial for killing a sex trafficker who trafficked her when she was 16. And there was evidence that the Kenosha Police Department had that he was trafficking 12 other young African-American girls, possibly as young as 12. And the police didn't do anything with that evidence at the time that he was killed. They had that evidence for over two months. These cases bring to our attention the gross inequalities in American society right now. And I so sincerely hope that this book can take us to a better place. And I think that the idea of sharing privileges and rethinking leadership and alliance in a corporate context can get us there. And one more thing that corporations can do is sponsor self-defense classes. So there's a story in the book about Kelly Heron, who was training for a marathon. And several miles into her run, she stopped in a park bathroom. And there was a man hiding in the stall. And he emerged from the stall and started attacking her. And she just started fighting back like crazy. And she's like, not today. Swear word, swear word, not today. And she beat him off and somebody else came. They heard her scream and they came to her aid like Mm -hmm. a good bonobo. They were able to hold him until police got there and he was tried and convicted. And she started a small nonprofit called Not Today. Mm -hmm. This is heroic. She had taken self-defense from her employer. Her employer had supplied that like three and a half weeks earlier. Wow. So she knew that she had the ability to self-defend and thank goodness she was able to. So corporations absolutely can and should and must offer self-defense. It really will improve everything. I am thinking for organizations that are too small. Mm -hmm. There are professional associations could do the same thing. Absolutely. So I may 
work for a company that's not large enough to sponsor it. And some of our communities do. Exactly. And it's all about alliances. We need to form lots of small and big alliances. And the small alliances are, if you know a friend who's in an abusive relationship, you can offer to take her to a self-defense class. That's easier than anything else or trying to get her to go to therapy or get out of an abusive relationship, which is so classically difficult to do and also so dangerous in a way that our society absolutely fails to account. I volunteered for a while with a domestic violence Mm. organization. It's just heartbreaking to see the stats and to see the mental box that we can get in to think we have no choice. Right. I don't have a way out. And to think that we have no self, that we have no self worth defending. So Mm -hmm. it's just, we can spend years in therapy thinking about a self worth defending, or we can take a self defense class, have our friends take a self defense class and know that we have a self worth defending. Everyone who's listening has a self-worth defending. Everyone has a self-worth defending. Back to corporate setting. You mentioned senior women mentoring, supporting junior women. Is there a formalized process that you've seen, or is it just kind of ad hoc as, as a young person? I look and say, that one, I want Diane to be my mentor. For the women who are listening who have already achieved a level of success, is it incumbent upon me to reach down, not that there's an up and down, but reach to people who are not yet where I am and help them? I would say absolutely. And that it's nothing to be afraid of. That I think that the divisions between women in a corporate setting are based on a zero-sum mentality that there is only so much room for women in this organization and that there's a scarcity, that there's a scarcity Mm -hmm. of power. But if you take it from the perspective of the Bonobo sisterhood and a perspective of abundance, that abundance will actually materialize. And you see a junior woman and you take her under your arm and you're not afraid that she's going to take your place or reduce your value at all. It's actually the opposite, that when we lift up each other, we can really improve attitudes towards women in general. Well, so then one other piece that goes with that, for me, it's not that I am worried about losing something. It's just time that I'm already so overcommitted that I haven't put it on my priority list because I can find time for getting coffee. I don't necessarily find time to grab someone and say, hey, I'm walking down to get a cup of coffee. Come with me. I want to hear how you're doing today. Well, I think that corporate leadership can absolutely play a role in making sure that you have enough time. That when corporations set priorities, people meet those priorities. And those priorities should, in my opinion, include human resources. And I don't mean human resources. The department. (laughs) The department, the personnel department. I mean human resources in that when you have happier, engaged, connected employees, you're going to have a better ROI. And I don't question any of that. I'm just looking at my schedule and saying, oh my goodness, how do I add this and what do I bump? As the very practical question that as we're talking, I'm thinking I need to do more of this. Right. But what do I do less of? That really is a question of corporate leadership at the top, that when the leaders in a corporation value something, that not only does it trickle down, but they can demand that it trickles down. So they can set that as a priority and and put their money where their mouths are, you know, have, Mm -hmm. have retreats for female alliances, for female alliance development, uh, work with the community. There's endless things that corporate Mm -hmm. leadership can do to support things economically. So here's another question then. We run leadership development programs Mm -hmm. and I have advocated not doing women only programs Mm -hmm. because the power structure is male. And when we pull women out of the power structure, then all these dudes get this great training. Women aren't building the relationships with the men who are elevating in power Do we take a step back when we're doing women only, or is it just a both and? I think it's a both and, that you need space to develop female alliances outside of the current power structure, and you also need 
an opening to changing the power structure and a recognition that the power structure is based on exclusion of women. In one of these classes, I remember a conversation about how men deal with emotion versus women deal with emotion. And I've had the same conversation in CEO groups. Often when women are angry, they cry. Men aren't socialized to know what to do with women crying. And it's such a common phenomenon that men often don't recognize that when women get angry, they tear up. I'm not talking about falling on the floor sobbing, but physiologically, sometimes we tear up and cry. And it's not a help me thing. It's I'm pissed off. Mm -hmm. This is how my body reacts. And that makes me even madder that I'm in tears. And it happened because women and men were in the same room having that conversation that the men who happened to participate were able to talk about. So what do I do? Because I don't want to deal with you crying. It's bad enough that I have to deal with you being angry. But tears I, I can't handle. But the conversation, the women later felt more comfortable just being present. I don't have to run out of the room, deal with the crying. And the men were more comfortable with, you know what, I'm just going to say, look, I sometimes when I'm angry, I tear up and we're going to keep having this conversation. Don't help me. Don't do anything. Treat me just like you would an angry man in front of you. And then we go on. But being able to have that conversation with both genders and women feeling comfortable to say it in front of each other, it wouldn't happen if we're not all in the same room. And that was part of what struck me as there is benefit to having everyone together at times. I applaud that. I think that it's great to have that as an opening step to start really rethinking our socialization around these issues. And, you know, what you might refer to as wiring, I think of as a lot of socialization that, mm. well, boys don't cry. You can't show that. Yeah, that's true. At, you know, the man <laughs> box and girls getting punished for using what I call the language of violence. That there's a reason that we implode instead of exploding. And one of my students said, violence is emotion. Expressed. Yeah. So when men get violent, we just think they're violent. We don't think of it as emotional. And they express it violently because that's how they're taught is the acceptable way to do that. And I think that it's absolutely beautiful to have these conversations and to start opening the door and getting people to rethink their socialization and to see it, like to get out of it and to get outside of it and to see how it does or doesn't make sense or does it or doesn't serve them at work and in life. And some of these aren't at scale. This is what happens when humans talk. Right. And the next class may or may not ever have that conversation. Right, right. And I also wanted to say that it's all genders. I think all genders really are disadvantaged under patriarchy and especially men. You know, I spend a lot of time on, you know, patriarchy's effects on women, but it's also terrible for men. And to not have access to a full range of human emotion is not living and thriving. And when men are taught that their value is only economic or only protection, that's a terrible message to send to a human being. And I hope that the book is an opening into that conversation. So are you recommending men read it also? This isn't a women's revolution. We're going to overthrow you. We're not overthrowing patriarchy. We are building a sisterhood. And it is an absolute invitation for men to read it. I would love for men to read it. It's critical for men to read it. And I think that I say a lot of things in the book that men really need to hear because they're participating in a system and thinking that they're benefiting from it. And I would really love for them to question that honestly. So for example, hookup culture, where men might think like, this is great because we can have sex several times a night without any swipe effort. Left, swipe right. Yeah, without <laughs> any effort at all. But I think that this sexual culture is harmful to men in ways that they're starting to talk about. And it's very depersonalized. And women are starting, women have been, but are really starting to talk about that too. And I hope that the book furthers that conversation in pretty specific ways. As we are coming to close on the interview, you talk about the promise and the hope that we know there are problems with women being sex trafficked, women being abused by domestic partners. The stats on rape are astounding now that we're starting to see them. 
and there are opportunities forward. In the business setting where I think many of our listeners reside, while we may not be able to address sex trafficking necessarily, we can address how we interact and elevate our workforce, whether we're at the board level or anyone in the company. And for women listening who are not in positions of power, we still have power. Women can support one another and our male allies can support. So one of my early experiences, and this dates me, I was walking into a meeting with a male colleague. We were peers, a senior executive meeting. He was invited to sit down. I was invited to go buy someone a pack of cigarettes. (gasps) And he said, here, let me go with you. Hmm. So that amplified my value. And that for me was such an important moment because it did say she's equal. Mm -hmm. And that working relationship has formed a foundation for me And that person and I haven't worked together for probably 30 years or 25 years. But that one act, and it was not just female allies, but male allies, and we weren't in power. It was, here, let me treat you like an equal. It's amazing how helpful that one behavior was. That's a great story. And I think that it shows a couple things. One is that power is everywhere, and it's also an illusory concept in a way. And it's something that changes and that we as humans can change. Who has power, what power means, and to share it is something that's very accessible for us. And there are probably five instances you could think of off the top of your head where you've helped a younger woman in the workplace and done for her what that guy did for you so that she knows that she's worthy Mm -hmm. because of your mentorship or help or extending a hand that you probably do every day. And we need to do that really consciously and programmatically and organically. And like I said, not be afraid that we're going to lose power by giving our power away to someone younger or older. We've talked about mentorship, but we haven't yet talked about sponsorship. And I realize we only have a couple minutes left. But the idea that as a sponsor, I'm lending my political capital to someone else to elevate them. And I think that's another way that we do and may not do as consciously and programmatically as we could. I think that's also a great point and maybe a good point to end on. One thing that you can do is support Bonobo Sisterhood Alliances and sponsor self-defense courses that are infused with a Bonobo philosophy for women and girls. Brilliant. Thank you. Diane, how would people learn more about your book? I realize we can buy it probably on all online stores, but learn more about you and your book. Go to the bonobosisterhood.org. Send me an email. Mm. Read the book. Yeah, you you have to read the book. I haven't done a TED Talk yet, so I guess you have to read the book. Well, listen to this. <laughs> you said it's also available as an audiobook. Is that on Audible? It is. Okay. So I'd encourage you to read it. And I, I'm really excited at this point to share it with the world and just see what the world thinks. I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to share it with you and our listeners. It's really important to recognize that men are our allies on this and that this book is an invitation to join us in this effort and not be afraid of women having power. For both of us, some of our strongest mentors have been and are men. I wouldn't be where I am today without several important, generous, and kind men in my life. And I realize that that's a wonderful privilege and they're half of the human race. I mean, why would I ever exclude men in the same way that patriarchy excludes women? Diane, we've talked for an hour about this. What do you want our listeners to take away from the book and certainly everyone who reads your book? I want everyone who reads the book or has listened to this to be inspired to know how much they can change in the world. And that they don't have to accept things the way they are just because that's the way it's always been. The bonobos really show us a different way, a roadmap for human thriving. So I'm inspired by the bonobos. I want you to be inspired by the bonobos and really get out there and start rethinking the power of female alliances. And I want to amplify one piece of that. This doesn't mean if I am junior, if I'm young, if I'm 15, 
I can't amplify other women and I can't also quiet other voices that are disempowering. No matter who I am, I get to have a voice and I can create my own power. It's not those people in power have to fix it. It's I get to fix it. Exactly. Oh, you're a good student and a great bonobo. Welcome to the Bonobo Sisterhood. Thank you, Diane. This has been fabulous. To our listeners, thank you. Like us, share us, make sure you comment on your favorite podcast platform, share Diane's information, share her book. And if you are not already, follow us on LinkedIn. To our listeners, thank you for joining us and for using this information to innovate and evolve your leadership. Please remember to like and share today's episode. And a special thank you to the International Leadership Association, whose partnership made today's interview possible.